Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Stern Policy Center here at Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson. Hudson Institute uh, promotes a secure, free, and prosperous future through strong American leadership. We've got a long track record on infrastructure issues, on creative financing of infrastructure issues, uh, dating to our days in Indianapolis, where we worked closely with then Mayor Steve Goldsmith, and of course, uh, my predecessor, Mitch Daniels, uh, as governor of Indiana, played a key role in the uh, transportation infrastructure innovation area, as we all know. Hudson's also, also, also was the home of now Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow, who uh, all of us miss, and we'll hopefully welcome back uh, here perhaps in seven years when uh, she's done with her big job. Want to note on a personnel note, this is the last event that our events manager, Rachel Cox, is doing. She's been with Hudson for four years, and she's done a superb job, and all of us will uh, deeply miss her. So salute to you, Rachel. Well, I'm delighted to welcome everyone today to what is an absolutely all-star cast of top executives in the public transit sphere for our discussion. As all of us know, uh, many of America's mass transit systems are facing a changing transportation landscape, aging infrastructure, rising pension costs, declining market shares, regulatory burdens, and other impediments that challenge transit agencies as they provide an indispensable service for the public. At the same time, these uh, agencies are facing unprecedented changes in mobility due to car share and ride share services and the emergence of autonomous vehicles. So the question for us today is, can America's public transit systems benefit from these innovations and introduce market-oriented reforms? The all-star cast we have on our panel shortly include uh, Pete Ron, the uh, Secretary of Transportation for the State of Maryland, Paul Wiedefeld, the General Manager and Chief Executive Officer of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Philip Washington, the Chief Executive Officer of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority, and our good buddy, David Horner, partner at Hudson, Hunton and Williams here in Washington, and also a member of the Board of Directors of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. We'll hear from them shortly, and David will uh, moderate the discussion. But first, we have the honor of hearing from uh, DJ Gribben, Special Assistant to the President for Infrastructure Policy. DJ is known as uh, an innovator in transportation circles. Uh, he previously headed uh, government advisory for Macquarie Capital, in which he led advisory teams structuring public-private partnership transactions for government clients. Uh, he also served as Chief Counsel to the Federal Highway Administration and General Counsel for the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, and his portfolio, I think, speaks for itself. Special Assistant to the President for Infrastructure Policy. This is obviously one of the big priorities uh, for the President for the Trump administration. Without any further ado, let me uh, welcome DJ to the uh, podium. Thank you. Can you get out? Early in my tenure at the White House, uh, we did an event where I put together, with uh, the help of Michael Harkins, who came as detailed here from USDOT, a permitting chart that showed, here's what you have to do to permit a federal project. And I was supposed to be just an easel holding up for the president. But then at a certain point in the conversation, he just held the mic out to me, and I started explaining what the chart was. At the very end of it, he said, like, be careful, don't trip over that, because then you'll really make news. So I thought about, after this <laughs> introduction, be careful, don't, don't fall down these stairs, because that's all people remember from this event. Um, so thank you very much for having me here today. It's uh, great to be back amongst uh, friends and, and colleagues. And what I thought I'd do is spend, um, is there a clock? Or are you doing 20 minutes? OK. Uh, spend 20 minutes, and is, I assume this is being recorded? OK. So. If, you, if I had a staff, like they, these questions would have been asked uh, before I got to the podium, but uh, it's, it's uh, an amazing job where you do your own scheduling, but you also get to sit in the Oval Office and have conversations with the president on infrastructure. So uh, I'll take that trade any day. Um, so what I thought I'd do is spend just a few minutes giving the broad outlines. I know a number of folks here have been in prior sessions we've done. Uh, where I've walked through in some detail what we're thinking of. So what I thought I'd do is just kind of hit the highlights and then turn it over to you. We do Q&A uh, so the conversations focus a little bit more on what you're interested in as opposed to what I think you might be interested in. So um, 
with that, uh, this is a very interesting time for infrastructure in the US. We have a president who is a builder uh, who actually has been responsible for building very significant infrastructure projects. Uh, as, as a result of that, infrastructure played an outsized role in the campaign, and they created a position for the first time in American history where they have one person who focuses on nothing but infrastructure inside the White House. So I've been very blessed to be able to selected for that role. And then carrying that tradition on, I created an office in the Council of Environmental Quality that for the first time focuses on nothing but infrastructure and environmental permitting issues as they affect infrastructure. So we have a very, very infrastructure focused White House, not only from the rhetoric side, but also from the, the staffing side as well. So. Um, let me talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish. I think everyone here understands that the system really is broken. We have about 240,000 water main breaks in the US a year. Um, highway congestion we've talked about for years being in the, in the hundreds of billions of costs on our economy. Um, interestingly, I didn't realize before I got here is that we had 300 power outages. These are outages not caused by weather or other events. These are the system can't just sustain the load. So 300 times in the US last year the power went out as opposed to 76 times in 2007. So uh, almost a, well, a four-fold increase in power outages. Um, the other thing that we've been talking a lot about is the fact of uh, that we have very much a federalist system when you think about infrastructure in the United States. So only about 14% of uh, funding for infrastructure is federal. The other 86 is relatively evenly split between um, state and local governments and the private sector. So part of what we're trying to do, and you've been reading about, is how do we use the scarce federal funds that we have to leverage up more state, local, and more private sector investment. Now, don't make a mistake in saying we don't think the federal government should have a role, or we have a role that we're trying to push on the state and local governments. What we're saying is there's been a trend currently in the US to have more state and local government investment in infrastructure. And what we want to do is accelerate that trend primarily because taxpayers are telling us that they're happy to invest in infrastructure, but they'd like to invest at the local level, right? Um, very hard to get taxpayers as, as evidence of the fact that we haven't seen a gas tax increase since 1903. Very hard to get people, American public, excited about sending dollars to Washington. However, as, as Phil Washington demonstrates, people are very happy to send dollars uh, to the local community. Well, maybe not very happy, but they're willing, <laughs> more importantly, to send dollars. So we talk about Measure M in LA. 72% of the public voted for that initiative. $120 billion is gonna be invested in infrastructure in Los Angeles County. Um, that is a huge success story, but it takes someone like a Mayor Garcetti with incredible political courage to do something like that. So part of what we wanna do with our incentive program is say, listen, if you as a state uh, or local elected official are willing to create a new revenue stream for infrastructure, we as the federal government wanna partner with you in, in doing that. Now, so we've got a new, we're creating a new incentives program to do that. What we're not doing is we're not eliminating the highway trust fund and taking those dollars to spend on this or eliminating state revolving funds and taking those dollars to do this. So for the, for the, in the general sense, we wanna keep existing programs where they are, but to the extent that Congress layers on top of that um, and is willing to spend additional on infrastructure, we wanna get the best return on investment for US taxpayer dollars. The best way to do that is to combine them with state, local, private funds, and, and create as robust a revenue stream as possible for infrastructure. Um, if you think about the incentive program that I just talked about, where we're, where we're gonna focus primarily on creating new revenue, urban areas like Los Angeles will do very well under that, rural areas not so much. So in addition to the incentives program, we're also gonna have a rural program that'll be block grants going out to states that essentially will allow governors to make decisions around how they want to invest in rural infrastructure. And that will include all governmental infrastructure, which also includes broadband if you're in rural areas. Um, and then we're also gonna look at uh, creating an opportunity to encourage transformative projects. So these are large capital intensive projects that are, are in new industries where it's very difficult to get private debt to help finance that. And then finally, we wanna plus up our lending and uh, programs. So TIFIA, WIFIA, RIF, expand eligibility for those programs, increase the amount of funding for those programs. Uh, we get phenomenal leveraging out of that. Uh, TIFIA gives us about 40 to one in terms of we get $40 worth of project built for every one US taxpayer dollar spent. So we'll take those deals uh, all day long. And then lastly and most importantly, huge push on permitting reform. 
So uh, if anyone in this room has built a project, you know how incredibly maddening the current system can be. It's duplicative. Um, we have government agencies not cooperating with one another. Um, things are done sort of sequentially instead of concurrently. And so the president in August signed an executive order that requires agencies to work together. Uh, we, we branded that one federal decision, where we want the federal government to make one decision on a project. We want um, the, the permitting agencies to sign on to the record of decision with the lead federal agency. And we want to get the best environmental result, but we want to do it in a very reasonable period of time, as opposed to currently where it can take years or sometimes even decades to get a project all the way through the process. So there's been an estimate that uh, reducing permitting down to two years uh, would generate $3.6 trillion in economic benefit. So it's one of those things that's it's, it's nuanced, it's boring, to be honest with you, um, but it's incredibly impactful. And we could have a dramatic impact on our country and our economy if we can take our permitting process. And again, we're not cutting corners. We're not sort of letting people do things they can't do under current law. We're just making decisions efficiently, and we're making decisions as one federal government. Uh, so we've got the executive order out there. Uh, next month, we'll be rolling out our legislative principles. Those principles include a, a significant and robust permitting section, and we look forward to a very lively debate with Congress. Um, and we're hoping, actually, to enlist mayors and governors and county executives into this, this conversation, because as I talk to people about what I'm doing, uh, folks inside of D.C. sort of think, well, that doesn't make any sense. We're moving power from D.C. to state and local governments, and not surprisingly, state and local government leaders are quite excited about that. So um, we're going to work hard the first part of next year to make sure that we continue to fully engage our, our mayors, our governors, our county executives to kind of come to Washington and work out a way where we have the, we, we take the current you know, state, uh, federal, local partnership and make it a little bit more workable for those that actually own the assets and for the most part pay for the assets. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I'll sit down here. It'll be a little more conversational. Thank you, uh, DJ, for uh, those remarks on the president's uh, and your office's bold agenda on infrastructure uh, financing and reform. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Uh, Clive Lipschitz over here. Oh, wait. Let's wait for the microphone, please. Let's say a second here. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, P3 centers, and particularly the idea that's been talked about of regional centers of excellence, potentially with the federal government putting people in there, um, helping them develop uh, common expertise that could be used across you know, state regions, um, and also possibly deploying the Australian model um, through these, uh, the, these P regional P3 centers? Um. Are you talking about P3 centers or are you talking about federally funded P3 centers? I'm, 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 talking, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not talking about federally funded. I'm not talking about federally funded. I'm, I'm talking about at the state level, level, but rather than have you know, the, the infrastructure Ontario replicated 50 times, you know, do it maybe six, seven regions uh, around the country. I, th I think that, I mean, intuitively it makes sense. I think in practice it hasn't had a particularly good track record in this country. Um, our states tend to be pretty independent. And um, I mean, I know that an effort's been tried in the Northwest, an effort's been tried in the Rocky Mountains. Um, I think if just US history would indicate that the best P3 entities are those that are focused on a specific state. I think it's incredibly helpful to have a P3 entity in a state that is focused just on that procurement method because they tend to be quite complex, quite expensive, and quite, quite time consuming. Um, I just don't, you know, the Australian Canadian models for some reason don't carry as well to the US and it's been tried several times. I mean, having more expertise out there is always a good thing. I just haven't seen it work yet in the US. Yeah, please identify yourself. OK, well, okay. Robert Hershey. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what can be done to get things on the internet so that the funding can be gathered in a transparent manner and you can bring in the private sector and get agreement that everybody can see. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally fine. What, what would you put on the internet to help with transparency? Uh, the meetings for getting together the funding and agreeing on what you're going to do. 
Uh, we're doing federally or around projects? Both. Um, yeah, so I think federally, most of these conversations would not be on the internet um, because they're quite politically uh, impactful. So I think for us to have a, a, a robust early days discussion, then obviously the debate will move into committees and through the House floor and through the Senate, all of which will be you know public and uh, and the floors are obviously televised. Right. Right. Uh, Art Gazzetti with the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, uh, DJ, I'd like to ask uh, how this proposal might connect to a couple other pending uh, uh, efforts. One is, uh, will this be you know, connected at all to a reauthorization of surface transportation programs? Is this one off or is this sort of the first step towards an ongoing uh, set of policies? And, and in a similar vein on, on tax reform, there's been a lot said about, you know, uh, private activity bonds uh, being uh, foregone perhaps and uh, also state and local taxes uh, not deductible, Th those things would seem to be taking a couple tools away, but you might have another perspective on that. So I, my question is, A, linkage to surface transportation reauthorization, and B, linkage to tax reform. So on the linkage of surface transportation, um, as you know, the highway, the current highway authorization ends in 2020. Uh, I, I think we have, you know, a lot of this is sort of subject to change because we haven't finalized everything yet. But I think the, the general inclination we're going in now is working very closely with our partners on Capitol Hill to make sure that we don't end this debate and still have a 2020 issue. Um, I, I also think that we're not inclined to do a full-blown reauthorization of the entire program. Um, but to, to be honest with you, to a large extent, we would defer to our partners on the Hill in terms of what they think needs to be accomplished as part of this initiative. Um, on the second bit on the tax reform component, I get this asking a question a lot. Uh, there are many, many, many moving pieces in tax reform. Uh, the administration initiative was to keep taxes low, to generate economic growth, to create new jobs. We would not trade that for specific provisions, and we've left a lot of the horse trading to, to Capitol Hill on that. Me personally, obviously, I hope that uh, we come out of the tax reform debate with lots of tools that are needed to help spur infrastructure development. But um, you know, there's just been a, a huge number of trade-offs that are being made. Our top priority, uh, because of the enormous impact it'll have on our, our economy, is to get tax reform passed. Next question. Good afternoon, uh, Tyler Gage. I uh, work in private air carriage, uh, but in a very public environment. So my question for you is, we all are probably aware of uh, President Trump's remarks about our third world airports. Um, we're obviously still trying to improve them. However, what is Mr. Trump or President Trump's uh, plan to really streamline A, next gen air transportation alongside the FAA, and B, uh, get us to first world airports and airlines for that matter? Yeah, so on, on, uh, the, the president has uh, talked repeatedly about his frustrations with the quality of, of U.S. airports. I remember I used to commute weekly to LaGuardia and was just stunned that they would have these tarps hanging from the ceiling with a hose going down to a trash can whenever it rained, right? I mean, that's, that's just, it goes beyond embarrassing. Um, so the, 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 you know, on the air traffic control front, obviously we were supportive of Chairman Schuster's effort to help move air traffic control to a nonprofit entity um, because what that does is that allows the development of next gen without um, it being subject to the whims of congressional uh, appropriations, without being subject to federal procurement rules, which would un unbelievably expedite that process. Uh, that debate occurred in the House and sort of is, uh, is stalled currently. Um, uh, in terms of funding for airports themselves, I think what our package does is uh, encourage increased in incentives to invest in airports. So, good question. My name is Mark Carr. I work in transportation policy. I recently delivered a paper on uh, the inconsistencies between benefit cost analysis processes in various transportation modes of government. Uh, are you folks? Uh, trying to uh, identify a consistent set of processes across various modes and uh, discount rates and benefit cost ratios and things. What are, can you explain a little bit about how you're going to be racking and stacking 
Sure, no, that, that is an excellent question because I should also highlight when we talk about the incentive program, where state and local governments are coming to us with projects and with revenue streams to help fund those projects, asking for kind of federal help on top of what they've already uh, proposed raising, that we would be agnostic as to project, as long as it's governmental, and agnostic as to the way they raise revenue. Um, so for at least the, for those components of projects, we're going to be a little getting out of the benefit cost analysis assessment because um, you know, if, if you have a traditional highway program that's 80 federal, 20 state, or 20 non-federal, then the federal government needs to be very involved in terms of what are you building and where are you building and how are you building all that because it's, it's mostly our money. I think that dynamic shifts when we become a minority investor in a project. Um, where the project proponent is paying the vast majority of the cost, we need to be a little less sensitive and less intrusive in terms of are they, are they building the right thing the right way. All four sort of streamlining that stuff, but, but the, our, our major focus has been letting communities make more decisions around what they're building and how they build it and how they finance it, letting the federal government be as supportive as we can, primarily by streamlining process and letting these things be built in a, in a reasonable time frame. Hi, DJ. How are you? Dan Dornan, Prince George's County, uh, Department of Permitting, Inspections, and Enforcement. A comment and then a question. Mm -hmm. The comment is I appreciate your challenge of streamlining the permitting process. Uh, four years ago, we set up a new department to do just that. And the testimony is that when the MGM Casino Hotel was built, they said it would take 20, uh, 48 months through the permitting process and building. Mm. It took them 24 months because we streamlined the process. So it can be done, but it's a real challenge. But my question has to do with really getting back to the private sector development side of things. Like at MGM, there's a lot of resources available if you link them to transportation in the right way, which I think they've done there. Uh, a lot of people say the developers don't necessarily contribute adequately to transportation infrastructure. So the question is, if we're going to expand the revenues coming from the private sector, what role do you see as the development community through things such as transit-oriented development or joint development, which is really a, another leg in that stool of resources that's out there besides just taxes or tolls? No, that's an excellent question because I think there's huge value um, in, or use value twice, in value capture around particularly large transit projects. Uh, I had a client in the past that was hesitant to try to create uh, a tax increment financing district because the benefits of that would not occur until in the future. Um, there, there is a lot of excitement around the concept that Todd or Transit Available could help finance, uh, pay for the capital improvements in year one. Um, unless you're in Hong Kong, that will never happen. And so I think there's, we need to have a conversation that includes developers and others of any time we're building infrastructure and we're using governmental funds to do that, and as a result, we're creating wealth for private participants, that the public share in that. I mean, the reason why that land is so much more valuable is because the public sector has invested in that region. Um, you know, it needs to be fair, it needs to be rational, but that would be a great sort of new revenue stream where what we're thinking of is counting the net present value of that revenue stream so there's a little bit of a premium in terms of creating long-dated um, revenue as opposed to one-time shocks. Good question. Last question. Hi, Matt Bell. I work for a railroad uh, contractor association. Some of our members, Skanska, Clark, uh, have worked on LA Metro and, uh, of course, WMATA. Uh, my question to you is uh, Congresswoman Comstock came out with the bill last week. Um, Congressman Delaney, obviously a Democrat, came out with the bill in February, both kind of encouraging more contracting out of uh, – private companies helping with maintenance, construction, et cetera. Um, just would want your thoughts or remarks on that. Yeah, so one of the criteria we think about using um, as part of incentives is are you using a contracting method that actually lowers the overall cost of the procurement? Uh, in a way, that's almost an in-kind contribution to the project. So if you're using design, bid, build, old way of doing things, that's slow and inefficient and quite expensive. And if the government, we're not, we're not sort of mandating this, but we're just saying, hey, if you come back with something that, that creates significant cost savings as a result of the procurement method, we'll count part of that towards your score because that, in essence, lowers. I mean, we can raise more revenue for infrastructure or we can lower the cost of uh, infrastructure. Both are economically the same thing. So we want to make sure that we're including efforts that are made to be creative and to lower the cost of living infrastructure in addition to just looking at the revenues. So I think we've got that uh, covered. Um, 
that gets a little on the subjective side. And one of the things we're really focused on in terms of the incentive package is to have clear, measurable, objective criteria. Uh, and that, that ideally, it's statutory, we would have the criteria. And here's the weighting for each criteria. Because our goal is for applicants to be able to grade their own application, basically. Right? So we want to get rid of this black box where you send applications to Washington and you win or you lose, but you're never quite sure why. Uh, to the extent we're trying to incentivize behavior, we need to be really crystal clear and incredibly transparent around what we're looking for and what behavior we want to incentivize so that people sort of move that direction. Great. Well, DJ, I want to just uh, thank you for these uh, characteristically insightful remarks. Hope that uh, we thank can you welcome for you me. back uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. David. Yes, so uh, why don't I ask the panel uh, members to take the stage wherever you wish. See, any seat is fine. Uh, thank you again, DJ. That, those were hugely informative comments, and we very much appreciate the Hudson Institute providing uh, this venue for a discussion of an important topic, the future of public transportation. Uh, again, my name is David Horner. I'm a partner at the law firm of Hunton and Williams in Washington, D.C., and a member of the D.C. Metro Board. Um, before beginning our discussion, I'd like to um, recognize a few members of the audience we have with us today, a former deputy administrator of the Federal Transit Administration, Sherry Little. Hello, Sherry. Thank you for joining us. And I believe we also have a, another deputy administrator of FTA with us also, Sandy Bushu, as well as several members of WMATA's board, Metro's board, uh, Jeff Marushian, who is the District of Columbia's transportation director, uh, as well as uh, Steve McMillan and Maryland's representative, Mike Goldman, who is here. Hello, Mike. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> so before putting a series of questions to the panelists, I thought I would set the table by making a few brief remarks. Um, many of our transit systems face unprecedented challenges today. They've seen declines in ridership nationwide as ride-hailing companies such as Uber and Lyft have taken market share. They've accumulated significant maintenance backlogs estimated by the U.S. Department of Transportation to approximate $86 billion. Uh, having extended service to the suburbs, they are now bearing substantial operating costs at low fare box recovery rates. And in the coming years, uh, they will need to contend with the emergence of autonomous vehicles, a potential game-changing technology that could provide point-to-point -point transportation on demand at a very low cost. It's a prospect that may transform our understanding of public transportation today as a fixed route service. It's quite interesting and we'll talk about it. Few doubt that public transportation will remain vital to the daily functioning of our major cities. The recent passage of local taxes for transportation in Seattle, Los Angeles County, and Denver reflects the public's desire to advance new transit construction in some of our nation's most congested urban areas. But beyond seeking additional funding, what can our transit systems do to meet the challenges posed by ride hailing, maintenance backlogs, declining population densities, and autonomous vehicles? Does the response involve a greater role for the private sector in public transportation? To help us answer these questions, we're fortunate to have our panelists. Uh, they are Maryland Transportation Secretary Pete Ron, to my immediate right, uh, Phil Washington, the CEO of LA Metro in the middle, and Paul Wiedefeld, the CEO of DC Metro. I think it's worthwhile to note something about their backgrounds before uh, getting the conversation going. Uh, Pete was appointed Maryland Transportation Secretary by Governor Hogan in January of 2015. As Transportation Secretary, Pete manages an annual budget of $4.9 billion and oversees 11,000 employees. He supervises all aspects of Maryland's transportation network, including the state's highway, transit, and rail networks, as well as its toll facilities. I should also mention the interesting fact that Pete is one of only four people who have led transportation departments in multiple states. As Pete previously served as the director of Missouri's Department of Transportation and New Mexico's Secretary of Transportation. 
you're on the road a lot. <laughs> uh, Phil Washington was appointed CEO of LA Metro in March 2015. As CEO, Phil manages an annual operating budget of $1.6 billion and is responsible for overseeing $15 billion in capital projects and an agency that transports 1.4 million passengers daily. Prior to becoming CEO of LA Metro, Phil served as CEO of the Denver Regional Transportation District, where he oversaw the completion of the nation's first large-scale transit PPP, or public-private partnership, the Eagle Fast Tracks Project, which has become a model for transit infrastructure PPPs today. And lastly, uh, Paul Wiedefeld was appointed general manager and CEO of DC Metro in November of 2015. In his role as CEO at Washington Metro, he manages an annual budget of $3 billion and is responsible for overseeing an agency of 12,000 employees who provide 1 million trips daily. Prior to joining DC Metro as CEO, Paul twice served as the executive director and CEO of the Maryland Aviation Administration, where he managed Baltimore Washington International Thurgood Marshall Airport. Thank you each for joining us. So let's have a conversation about some big topics in public transportation, starting with <coughs> ride hailing and autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, there has been a lot of uh, public discussion about how ride hailing and autonomous vehicles are complementary of public transportation, and that is uh, a line of thinking that has been advanced uh, uh, most vocally by uh, the companies developing ride hailing and autonomous vehicle technologies. <clears throat> a number of uh, surveys, however, have been published that suggest that public transportation agencies and ride hailing companies are in fact competing for riders. Um, so uh, if initial question is, how do you envision in the near term the relationship of public transportation agencies uh, to uh, ride hailing businesses, ride hailing companies. Uh, will the relationship be one of partnership or, or competition in the coming years? Um, Pete, do you have some thoughts on this question? Yeah, well, I do, although I don't know how well grounded they are in facts. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but my sense is that uh, so far, I, I really think these ride hailing operations frankly, are replacing more cabs than they're replacing mm -hmm. you know, public transit. Uh, now, as they grow, I, they could intrude upon that ridership even more. But um, I, you know, the decline in transit ridership that's occurring all over the, the country, I think, is more linked to the price of gasoline mm -hmm. and people's willingness to drive their own vehicle than it is to uh, the overall performance of, of transit or the competition from from Uber and all these other ride hailing services. So now if I was a cab company, I'd be very worried about Uber. Um, less, less so, I think, transit, although our transit operators might have a different opinion. Right, well, from the front lines what of public transportation in two major metropolitan areas, um, Phil, Paul, what are your respective views on the relationship or relevance of the emergence of ride hailing as an alternative to public transportation, Phil? Uh, well, uh, I see it as a partnership. Uh, you know, we have to partner with this new technology. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at an Uber who's losing uh, about a billion dollars a year, um, we have to, you know, really put that in perspective. Um, you know, partnering with these uh, these ride hailing companies, I think that's what we've tried to do in Los Angeles County. Uh, we've had pilot programs where uh, Uber gave discounts uh, if folks were going to rail stations and things like that. So it, it's, uh, in my view, a partnership. Now, at the same time, uh, we are creating our own Uber lift like service in LA. Uh, with smaller vehicles using our uh, drivers as well. And we're looking at curb to curb uh, kinds of things. So uh, we are uh, piloting that right now. It's called micro transit. And that's something that has been adopted around the country. Uh, but one of the things I, I'll say about just ridership and the decline in ridership uh, yes, uh, the impact of, of uh, you know, ride hailing uh, companies is having an imp impact on ridership. But one of the things that we did, we commissioned a study with UCLA 
uh, not too long ago, and this study has not been published yet. Um, and what came out of that study was one of the huge impacts of the decline in ridership is auto purchases. Now, uh, in the Southern California region, um, there was, over the last 15 years, there's been 2.3 million more people that have come to Southern California, 2.3 million more. Um, at the same time, there has been 2.1 million additional auto purchases. And that is very interesting to me. And so while we look at the Ubers and Lyfts of the world and we say that impacts our ridership, this auto purchase with, you know, 0% loans and, you know, all kinds of things, uh, I think that is something we need to watch as well. Low cost of insurance. Uh, when you look at out west and places like California, uh, where the maintenance uh, to own a vehicle is not very expensive either. Uh, it's not like back east where they're putting salt on the road and now you got rust on your car and all of that. I mean, there's no there's no snow out in Southern California. There's fires, um, <laughs> but uh, but but this this phenomena of uh, auto purchases is very very interesting to me. And according to that study, uh, that has a bigger increase um, with the bus ridership decline than even the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world. It's very interesting. Paul, what's your take? Um, I think it's an opportunity. Um, I think particularly on the shoulder uh, services we provide uh, late, in, late in the evenings and, and, uh, and uh, on weekends. I think it's potential there. It has the potential also for um, where we have uh, peak demand where it exceeds our capacity, for instance, at parking garages, and you can't find the space. Maybe you could Uber in and, and do something like that. And then uh, clearly it also has an opportunity on the disabled community and the services we provide there. Uh, we did just recently award a contract. They did not choose to participate, um, or they did but didn't make the cut, and it was filled by taxi, traditional taxi. So I think there's lots of opportunities there. I don't want to, uh, I don't see it necessarily as competition. At the end of the day, for me, um, it's, it starts with the service. Uh, you can't sell a product that's not good. So that's our, that's our concern, is to, is to fit, focus on the safe and reliable service. And then there's the, the two factors that, uh, both Pete and, and Phil mentioned in terms of vape, both gasoline and, and auto ownership, but then it's also uh, dependent upon your community. So our, our one of our biggest issues is telecommuting and the declining federal workforce. Well, you know, with a, with 40 percent of our roughly 40 percent of our peak service being for federal employees, well, obviously that changes either how they work or there are not as many people. That's going to change our numbers. Uh, so there's other factors that we that we have to deal with. Um, but it, to me, it always starts with what is the product we're selling first, get that right, um, and then uh, all these other things, things we don't control will be what they be, and you look for opportunities there, but uh, focus on your core mis mission. It's interesting, I was thinking uh, uh, with the aviation background, I remember uh, 10 years plus ago, it was the perfect storm. It was SARS, it was terrorism, it was the price of fuel. And uh, you know, the, the aviation world was you know, like, oh, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? And our focus at BWI was what we're going to do is we're going to be the easy come, easy go airport for the, for the Baltimore, Washington region. And that's what we focused on. It became the, the, the leading provider of, uh, uh, of air transportation in the, in the region by focusing on what we could control and not necessarily trying to outthink all these other things that are occurring around us and taking our eye off the ball of what's important to our customers. Well, just a brief follow up question to the panel, and then we'll move to another topic. It, your point about zero percent financing of new auto purchases. Of, um, we are aware that transit operates at a loss. Um, we also know, Phil, as you pointed out, that the, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world currently are providing service at a loss incurred by investors. So it seems that multiple modes are engaged in the, right now in a subsidy shootout. And like, who will be left standing? I mean, have you, <laughs> have you considered, I mean, so, you know, do you think it's, it's, it's fair to wonder whether private capital can outlast public capital as a provider of subsidy? I mean, I mean Phil, you're, you seem to be taking this point on board. What, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, government uh, subsidies, I mean, yep. government, uh, you know, subsidies can always outlast private. I mean, private subsidies are only going to last until they no longer see a return at some point. So you can't operate at a deficit indefinitely on the uh, private side. 
on the public side, you know, the American public has accepted that there's going to be a substantial subsidy to public transportation mm -hmm. and that there is some recognizable benefit for that subsidy. So uh, at some point, Uber's going to have to produce a profit or they're, or they're going to go away. It's often overlooked that the, the service is provided at a, at a loss. Um, well, let's turn to autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> so a lot of people think that we'll see fleets of autonomous vehicles on our streets within uh, 10 years or sooner. Uh, Ford says it could begin commercial production by 2021. Uh, more than three dozen companies from four different industries are piling in. Uh, these include uh, Google, NVIDIA, um, Lyft, Uber, uh, Ford, Volvo, Nissan. A huge amount of resource is being dedicated to developing a commercializable or marketable autonomous vehicle offering. Um, so um, the first question is, do you, do you agree that the appearance of autonomous vehicles on our roads is imminent? And if you do agree, what are the consequences for public transportation of kind of broad adoption of autonomous vehicles as an alternative to transit? Phil, what do you think? Sure. Um, well, I think it is imminent. Uh, and I think it's coming. I think we're in the middle of a transportation revolution with regard to technology. I mean, it's, it's akin to uh, when the stagecoach was like the, the mode of the day. Uh, and then auto ca uh, you know, automobiles came along. And you know, the stagecoach was, well, you know, we, we're going to be phased out. Uh, I think these AVs, uh, we must get ready for it. Um, I think there's going to be autonomous buses soon, um, autonomous vehicles. I think the, the technology is already there. I think in the next 10 years, we are going to see autonomous vehicles all over the road. Uh, the question becomes, uh, as you put it, uh, David, I mean, what's the impact on public transportation? We, I believe, have to uh, make sure that we allow the private sector a vehicle, no pun intended, a vehicle to bring their ideas to us. Mm -hmm. in, in the government realm, how do we uh, provide the private sector a way to come in with their ideas, with their alternative technical concepts? I mean, we have become, uh, as, as government entities in some cases, so prescriptive uh, in our performance uh, specifications I mean, we tell the private sector exactly what widget to use, uh, how much to tighten it, uh, everything. And so I think when we talk about this new technology, we don't know what we don't know. So the idea is to allow for the private sector to bring these ideas, make sure we have a vehicle where they can bring these ideas, whether it's unsolicited proposals or whatever. Uh, but I think this technology is coming. Um, you know, uh, the impact to transit depends on how we get on board with the technology and adapt it to public sector use. If I could ask a quick question of all of you, but you in particular, Phil, because you've just succeeded in raising $125 billion in tax revenue for your network over 40 years, which is a phenomenal accomplishment. Does the, um, the X factor of autonomous vehicles chill, long-dated uh, commitment to f fixed capital investment I mean, because we, we don't know what's going to come? I mean, sort of long-dated investment horizons become problematic. Mm -hmm. um, is this something yeah, you're considering yeah. inside of LA Metro? Well, yes. I mean, I, you know, it, it, all of this is happening right now, the technology, but at the same time, we had 10 billion boardings uh, in the country of public transportation at the mm -hmm. same time. So these are record amounts of boardings that we've had at the same time this new technology is coming. So what we are trying to do uh, in L.A. County with that measure, which, by the way, has no sunset, you know, how's that? So, oh, but we only talk about the first 40 years, though, right. uh, 120 billion, but it has no sunset. Um, you know, so we don't know what we don't know. And so, again, while we looked at technology and modes over the 40-year period, um, in my mind, I'm not locked in to any particular mode. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we must provide that vehicle for the private sector to come in and say, you know what, it may not be, we have something different to go down to Sepulveda Pass than a subway. Maybe it's a monorail, I don't know. Uh, but to provide that vehicle for the private sector to come in and say, you may be thinking about this, but here's another alternative. And us being able to evaluate that new idea uh, and look at it seriously. So we've got uh, assumptions in the 40-year plan, uh, but I'm not locked into any particular mode. We're open to see what new technology uh, is forthcoming. Paul, in, in your long-term planning, are you beginning to take into account um, the, the X factor of AV? Um, and if so, how, how can you do it? Can you do it now? Um, are the outcomes of deployment of AVs so unpredictable that you just must go on until you know the answer? Um, I, think, I think we have to step back a little bit when we think about it. If, if you just think, uh, you think of the telephone, right? So when the, when the mobile telephone came out, you would think initially, well, it's going to be an issue for landline telephones. Mm -hmm. But think of what it's evolved into, right? <laughs> it's just part of our culture. It's part of how we do everything we do now is by, you know, one of these things. So I think we have to keep, uh, you know, very, very open mind in a system like ours where we're not looking at major expansion of the system and basically just reinvestment of the existing system in the near term. I don't see that changing uh, in the near term because I just don't think they'll be there quick enough. But as we think about the future and what we want in the region, then I think uh, similar to, to what Phil said, then yes, then you've got to say, well, let's not just keep thinking this way. Let's start to think much broader. Uh, but in the immediate future, I don't see it having as much of an impact on us. And I think it's, uh, again, I think it's not only just the transit industry. This is going to have so many impacts on everything that we do, uh, the whole economy, you know, just how it's all based, you know, if it, if it plays out to the maximum that, that people sometimes talk about. I think we'll be a bit part of that. <laughs> um, and it'll be much more in... in in uh, Pete's world, uh, in the transportation arena, what it does for highways and tolls and his revenues and his insurance and hospitals and all that all starts to change uh, potentially. Um, and we will be a part of that. But since we're not in a, a very aggressive gro growth mode like some of the other properties around the country that have gotten large uh, referendums passed built on or based on building lots of new lines, we're not in that mode right now. So I just don't see it hitting us uh, as soon uh, in our thinking right now. Well, and the category of the topic of new builds, of course, um, there has uh, emerged a role for the for private infrastructure developers. Uh, Phil, this is a topic you know a great deal about, as do you, Pete. I mean, each of you have overseen or are overseeing now uh, the delivery of large-scale transit projects on a PPP basis. Um, Phil, you oversaw the completion of the Denver Fast Tracks Eagle P3, a $2.5 billion undertaking, uh, privately financed and delivered and now being operated and maintained by a developer. Um, you know, do you see more of this? Uh, do you see it in LA County? Um, and if so, what are, the, what are the rationales for pursuing PPP delivery of large-scale transit projects? Well, let me, let me say that, uh, you know, P3s must be in our toolkit. It's not a panacea. You can't do it for every project. But it must be in our toolkit to deliver um, mega projects out here, or even small projects. Um, the idea that y you can share the risk, uh, the idea that you can accelerate projects, in the case of the Eagle project that you mentioned, which is a commuter rail line, uh, the idea that you can bring that project in 11 years ahead of schedule under, by the way, uh, the Penta P program that Mr. Horner uh, created back in the day. Uh, we took full advantage of that. Um, but, but the idea that you can bring this infrastructure uh, to fruition and implement this infrastructure much sooner with the risk transfer to the private sector is huge. Uh, and the idea that you would allow the private sector to bring in alternative technical concepts that, that actually ended up saving about $305 million on that project is incredible. Uh, so I, I, I think it must be in the toolkit. There's a number of, uh, of advantages. Uh, it's not free money. People think this is free. It's not free money. 
this was a 34-year arrangement with uh, a payback, a reasonable rate of return to the private sector, because at, at the end of the day, they're looking to make money, and this is America. Um, so uh, the idea that you can accelerate, you can transfer risk, and the private sector can make a reasonable rate of return is a win-win, uh, I think, when you're looking at public-private partnerships. And we're looking at many of them, multiple P3s in L.A. County. And what, what is happening in Maryland on the PPP front in respect of transit? You have the Purple Line in process. We have the Purple Line. And, uh, you know, and I'm going to be an unruly panelist minute. I want to digress to one thing you sure. ask, <laughs> yeah, which, which was simply, you know, are, are automated are vehicles real? And I would say they are absolutely real. They're going to happen much faster than anyone is expecting. Mm -hmm. If you look at... Um, there, I recall this photo of, a, of one of the broad, I don't know if it's Broadway or whatever, one of these main uh, streets in New York in 1906, and there was a couple of vehicles on it and horse-drawn carriages. And in 1913, the, the whole roadway was packed with automobiles. So these technologies can be adopted very quickly. And I'm even going to take off on more of a tangent when Paul just said the phones. Think of that. So I have a two-year-old grandson that we were trying to think of for a, for a Christmas gift. And we were looking in this catalog, and there was one of these princess phones, right? Uh, you remember those? I have a daughter. Yeah. You know, one of these princess phones. And I'm going, well, that would be cute. And my wife goes, you wouldn't have any idea what that thing even is. He picks up, he picks up bars of soap and goes, hello. And so it's like he wouldn't even recognize that as a phone. So, so now back to your question. No, but I think, that, I think you know, I, I'm minded to agree. I mean, that it scrambles a lot of, does it scramble a lot of long-term planning? I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sorry if I sound like I'm driving a point, but it just begs the question, like, how do you take this into account when you're considering long-term concessions of multi-billion dollar fixed capital investment transit projects, et cetera? What do you get? It's got to, right? I mean, but, but the private sector is quite mature, mm -hmm. and I'm confident that they are calculating into their, their equations this, you know, this risk of what happens if there's automated vehicles and the general purpose lanes are moving better than their hot lanes, as an example. What's that risk? They are far more attuned to that when they're coming up with their prices. On our side, just trying to operate a system with those vehicles. At what point do we get the real benefit of automated vehicles would be when you have s exclusive lanes to those. Mm -hmm. So when is there critical mass that says we're going to take a lane out of general purpose and restrict it to automated vehicles? When when does that occur? I don't know, but we're going to have to we're going to have to make that decision at some point. It's a big it's a big it's a big question for LA County that has its own network of hot lanes. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer your question now, <laughs> I apologize here. But so for the Purple Line, uh, it, you know, it's $5.6 billion over a 36-year period, six years of construction, 30 years of operation. Um, we were, as Governor Hogan came in, he looked at that, said that's too expensive, and was not willing to go forward unless we were able to reduce those costs and, and come up with a predictive way to... Um, to invest our funds. And so we went, and it's, you know, it was, I don't know if it was fair or not to our <laughs> proposers, but we said, wait a minute, we're going to give you lots of authority to come back with new ideas and ways to reduce costs. Uh, frankly, I saw one, obviously the one that we selected, is the one that came in with the greatest savings, reduced our cost uh, $550 million. Incredible. And we've, since that time, have had an additional savings from some financing of another $80 million. So we were able to impact the cost of this. And I like it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it gives us a predictable uh, cost over the, the 30 years in which, all of a sudden, now we know what we're going to be you know, appropriating for for that service, where when you own it yourself, you don't have nearly as much control over it as what you would think, and also being able to ensure that we're providing a good service to our customers. So it's, it is expensive, uh, but for us, we had $159 million of state dollars going into the construction period, and then 
uh, about $149 million a year for the next 30 once it's open. So I, you know, financially, I think that's a, a good deal. I think the service is going to be a very high quality service and will definitely provide some mobility options to people along that arch of, uh, mm -hmm. of DC. As well as being a tie-in to Pulse Network. Absolutely. Which is good stuff. Can I add one more yes. thing to that? No. Uh, you know, the idea, and, 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 and just hit on this, the idea that you are you have performance metrics and you this is an uh, availability payment model that is built on incentives and penalties based on those performance metrics is a big thing, uh, where you can penalize if those performance metrics uh, are not met, I think is a huge piece. And, and the other piece is life cycle. So there is a, there's an incentive now for the builder um, to build a quality project because you can penalize them. Uh, that is huge. That's a huge incentive uh, during that 30-year operations and maintenance period for them to build it right uh, because they can be penalized through the performance metrics. That is a huge advantage, I think. They have to live with the results of their own That's right. work. <laughs> Just an important, big incentive. So the last topic we'll discuss before opening the uh, mic to questions is uh, how to dispose of this massive maintenance backlog. Uh, the, uh, of the three panelists here, uh, Paul, you probably appreciate most keenly uh, the, <laughs> the, the challenges posed by um, large maintenance backlogs. Be before you became CEO of, of DC Metro, um, the system had accumulated $6.7 billion in um, unaddressed maintenance. Um, how, it, it, how can the private sector help uh, DC Metro work through that backlog? Are there changes in contracting techniques that we need to um, consider uh, to accelerate the reduction in the backlog and make existing dollars go further? Yeah, I, th I think the uh, first challenge that we face, and, and probably a lot of our other properties, is the policy decision that basically you're no, no longer going to um, push off those back. Those not, not necessarily they, they became backlog because you weren't dealing with the issues to begin with, and so basically the policy decision has been made that we're no longer doing that, and so we've had to do a number of things to, to move us in that direction. So that's the first thing that has to be done, because mm -hmm. otherwise the money just isn't there because it gets eaten up by the operating side of the house. So that's the first a large political slash policy decision has to be agreed to by any any organization, uh, which I think we've turned the corner on that. Uh, then it becomes an issue right now, how do we do this? How do we get the dollars? How do we deliver it? Um, it's, it's interesting, our capital program, which is about $1.2 billion uh, annually, about 80% of that, almost 80% of that, actually goes to the private sector today. <laughs> Um, so that is, you know, how, how, uh, how we deliver projects. Um, so it becomes, the challenge then becomes, um, are there ways to do it more efficiently? But also, always the balance, particularly in, and every system's going to have its own issues, but with our system with a two-track railroad, um, what's the balance between the impact on the customers and the service versus doing what you got to do to catch up with the backlog? Um, unfortunately, we had to do dramatic steps in that arena with SafeTrack. Um, we then went out to the private sector to help us do that because there was no way we could even do three years worth of work in one year with just our own resources. So that's what we did. And then into the future, we have to do that. So we're, we're moving that way in a number of areas where we have a preventive maintenance program that's now uh, with private resources helping us do that. And literally our track inspection, we use private resources to do that. Um, we just put out an RFP recently for a bus maintenance facility and bus operations unit. Uh, the second phase of the Silver Line uh, is one also that we would want uh, to do that. And it isn't necessarily uh, anything against our current employees or the current structure. It's just the reality of how do we deliver these large projects mm -hmm. in very limited time with minimum, imp minimum impact on our customers, but yet to try to make some headway on this backlog. So that's sort of the approach we're taking. Um, and I think, um, I think we, we've already seen some movement in that direction of what it means in terms of catching up, but it is a, a sustained effort. It's something that uh, you just can't claim victory. Um, it's, it's a mindset that we have to have a management mindset and a, and a uh, political public mindset 
that you know when these systems get old, we have to invest. Um, and if we don't, you can see very quickly what happens. And as they age, it grows exponentially. Those issues. So that's why we've been, with the help of the board, uh, where you know we continue to move in that in that direction. Uh, we need more dollars to do it. We don't have literally physically enough dollars to do it. And as you know, we don't have a dedicated source to support it, unlike uh, our friends in, in LA. But, uh, Pete and Phil, when you, when you consider um, alternative or innovative contracting techniques as a matter of policy, have you cons looked to other countries or their model transit agencies abroad that you think are thought leaders in this field or even you know, more broadly continents that you would write? I think DJ pretty much explain that, you know, there, there has to be, an, that, that, for it to work here, for whatever reason, you need an American model. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's been the European model, especially Spanish, uh, uh, more than any model that's been marketed a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, until somewhat recently, I, I, I continue to use the uh, second I-66 uh, procurement on the P3 for, for the highway as being really a model that in my mind is approaching what an American model mm -hmm. should look like. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we, the longer we get, the longer we're in this actively, I think we are finding the right, you know, the right nuance to have within our procurements. And so I, I'm just not a huge fan of availability payments, mm -hmm. even though in transit, that's your only option, right? They're not gonna pay for themselves. Um, but to a great extent, availability payments are, it can be a potentially expensive way to finance something unless you get other benefits that offset those costs. So um, I, no, I think the United States is, is, is developing the right models. Certainly the Denver uh, project was the first, we're the second. I think it will continue to be improved upon as others undertake this region. But Pete, innovative procurements meaning more than just um, P3. I think our procurements in general should allow much more flexibility in, in how we are procuring, and I think the public benefits from that. Interesting. Phil, I mean, do you have, um, I mean, are, you, are you like Pete, and you think the sort of indigenous homegrown approach is, is working well and will be developed further, or uh, do you see a broad uh, example that should be uh, mimicked here? Well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I agree with Pete, but I do think that there's things that we can learn from, you know, from other countries, obviously. Um, I, I think the American approach, I would rather call it a hybrid approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of looking at uh, things ar around the world and bringing those lessons back. Uh, when you start looking at uh, high-speed rail, for example, and, you know, we're trying to do high-speed rail in California, it's, we got we got a funding problem. Uh, but... <laughs> But when you start, and we've all written high-speed rail and rail around the world, I mean, uh, track maintenance, a simple thing like track maintenance is incredible. When you, when you ride uh, a high-speed rail in either Japan or even in Europe, I mean, it's incredible how smooth the ride is. Well, a lot of that is due to track maintenance uh, and the emphasis placed on track maintenance. So I, I think there's ways that we can learn some things and create this American model, if you will. Uh, I do agree with Pete on our contracting. We have to look at our contracting practices uh, right now. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, a contract, uh, an RFP and a doggone thing is 500 pages. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and, and so do we really think that the private sector is going to be able to decipher all of that? And most of them is, you know, terms and conditions, uh, and the scope is two pages long or something. So, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's crazy, but I, I do think we can learn some things. Uh, and as long as we remain open, as Paul was saying, to these new uh, innovative practices out there. Outstanding. David, I could make yes. two points. One is, uh, yes, international, obviously, we should always look there. But I think we do have a model, um, and I, I know airports take a beating, but uh, there's a lot of great airports in this country. And they're, they're, you know, at the end of the day, and I, of course, I always go back to PWI, um, but, you know, that is, that, successful. that's PWI. right, and it's, yeah. but what's interesting is, there is, that is funded through the exact same source that funds Metro. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, but yet it's thought of as a concession entity. It's thought as a money maker. It's always looking for ways to make dollars, whereas we don't have that sort of same mindset in the transit industry. And I think and when you, when you look at the Hong Kongs of the world, that's where they come from. So that's one part of it. The other part, I think, that, that would give probably the, the most uh, capability to be uh, much more innovative is, you know, we have so many rules and regulations in front of us where I can't just react as a business person, whether it's ethics regulations, whether it's, you know, procurement, it's just unbelievable. So if I, someone comes in with a great idea, basically then they've just boxed themselves out of potentially going after the work. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas in a business community, you would be seeking these people out, picking out which is the best, and starting to try different things. Uh, we just don't have that freedom. Um, and when you think of them, you know, you know, each of us running three billion plus businesses, but yet we can't sit down with someone and say, now, this is my issue, let me pick your brain, now let me pick your brain, I'm gonna pick part of this and part of this and just go. Mm -hmm. That's not how our world works. And then you end up with, yeah. you know, 500 page RFPs, where, and, and then you gotta box out people, it's just, uh, that's what undermines, I think, a lot of the creativity. And that's where you see in places like Hong Kong and places like that, they don't do that. They go out and do the business deal and move on, mm -hmm. and they're held, you know, they're held accountable, but they're not held to such tight constraints that they can't just make smart business decisions. I think the problem we've got is that our per the procurement mentality, certainly within government, I think, in the United States, is that you should always be able to compare an apple to an apple, mm -hmm. right? Whereas not only should we be able to compare an apple to an orange, we should be able to compare it to a kumquat. And if, that, if the kumquat's the best, you know, the best value to the public, we should be able to select that. And that's the challenge all of us face, right. is how do we get around that well, in fact, you get through it. You don't go. We don't go around laws, right? We, right. we go through laws. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. I, I reserve the right to ask a follow-up question to this exchange. But instead, first, um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I mean, and I've been asked to request you identify yourself. Yeah, Clive Lipschitz. Um, in addition to autonomous vehicles, there's another potentially disruptive technology out there that seems to be moving ahead faster than people thought, which is Hyperloop. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think it's crazy, but apparently it's, it's, it's moving ahead. So the question is, each of your agencies looking at that, what do you think about that as a future mode of transportation? So is it real? Yes. And you, I suspect you're already aware that Maryland uh, has provided a, <clears throat> pardon me, has provided a uh, utility permit to uh, the boring company from Elon Musk uh, to place uh, their version of the Hyperloop beneath uh, Maryland 295. Um, and some have asked why a, why a utility permit, and I just would add that we don't have a Hyperloop permit, so we had to figure out something, and the idea is that, that uh, this is a concrete tube underneath the roadway at a depth that'll have no impact on, on us, just like utilities. So anyway, we approach that. Um, it's very real, they're very serious. Uh, they have a, uh, I can't talk too much about their business model that they disclose to us, but um, I'm excited and I truly am, am waiting to be able to take the Hyperloop from uh, DC to Baltimore and it's, it's going to happen. It certainly shortened Phil's trip back to L.A. Yes, yes. <laughs> Can I add to that? I, I agree with Pete. Very, very real. We have met with um, Mr. Musk uh, a couple of times. Um, I mean, his SpaceX, his headquarters is like right in our backyard. Um, quick story, um, we went out to see him on a Sunday, uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Now, he gave the order to his folks to start digging a tunnel on the Thursday before. And he walked us over to the tunnel. He had an 80-foot hole, and he was digging. It was on his property, though. I mean, it's three days, and he's got a hole. And he's, I mean, the, the private sector, and this goes to what Paul was saying, I mean, it was incredible how he had this thought. And what he's trying to do is tunnel five times faster than the current technology. Now, this is incredible. Beat the snail. Beat the snail. Yeah. And, and I think it's coming very, very soon. Uh, Mr. Goldman. Yeah, I mean, very loud, but... Mike Goldman, uh, WMATA board. 
I want to return to the same subject of uh, autonomous vehicles, but since we have three transit operators here, I want to just add it and ask the question about autonomous transit vehicles, that is, subways without operators. Mm -hmm. We were at a conference last week, Pete and Paul and I, and the, the material shows that internationally there's about 26 subway systems around the world that either have subways or individual lines without operators. And here in the U.S., we have the same thing, but they're at airports. We call them people movers. At Dulles, Atlanta, Denver, San Francisco, probably it's being built by someone out at L.A. as well. So the question is, why don't we have autonomous transit systems here in America rather than just talking about autonomous vehicles? You know, what are the impediments to that in terms of capital costs and the elephant in the room in terms of labor costs and labor relations? So that's my question for the three transit operators here. Can, if that's a touchy one, I can answer that for you in a word. I think the answer is 13C. Yeah, well, that's one of them. But, but do, do any of you wish to elaborate on what 13C is? Um, 13C basically means that you can't uh, eliminate current jobs held uh, by, by different unions. Um, doesn't mean you can't um, provide additional jobs and, in effect, or provide jobs and through attrition, not uh, as long as you don't take jobs away. But the, the, the issue there really is it, it depends where you are. If you had a new system, it's definitely one that you should be looking at. For an older system, in effect, you would be recreating a system within a system, which would be very expensive. Um, so you'd have to, you know, you'd have to weigh: is it worth it? Um, um, so my decision wouldn't be driven by the labor part of it. It's just the the capital investment it would take to do that versus what you have today. So that would be the big issue for me. If it's a new system, like uh, like in Barcelona and some of the other places around the world, of course you would you would look at it. Guys, you know, same topic. You know, I'm satisfied with Paul's okay. answer. Yeah, so, <laughs> so am I. Um, so am I. Yes, sir. Uh, Mark Carr, um, consultant on transportation policy, uh, which I think is what I said when I asked the question to the other speaker. But uh, it occurs to me, you guys are really real estate plays. What are you doing with your real estate to raise revenue beyond tolls? Because, like. And there's no metro station that I go in where there's anything to spend your money on. Why not? You got plenty of room. Why can't I buy anything there? I can understand food because of the vermin and stuff, but why can't I buy a newspaper? Why can't I do anything there? You guys have the real estate. Same as outside the stations. There's nothing there. Uh, for me, uh, I agree. Um, and it is something that we're aggressively looking at. It's just to you know, rethink uh, our space. Uh, we did actually have a, a, an excellent uh, speaker at. We had an international conference last week, and uh, we're, we are following up quite a bit on, on that very issue because I think there's great opportunities for us there. I would, I would comment on that. I, I think it's something that we should be looking at. DJ mentioned this a little bit early, this value capture proposition. Uh, we need to be doing more of that. Uh, I call them transit-oriented communities and how we can – uh, put together tax increment finance districts, uh, how we can do these things. We, in many cases, are bringing that value. Transit is the value uh, that's creating this uptick uh, in, 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 in property uh, values around our stations. And so uh, what we've done in L.A. has been very, very deliberate in identifying transit-oriented community demonstration sites, demonstration sites where we will... Uh, look at those sites, look to leverage uh, our station area with perhaps the county, with the city, to build a, uh, an even larger transit-oriented development slash community and see how we can capture that value through TIF revenue. Now, that's, a, that's a, sometimes a tough proposition because, you know, that development, uh, you know, the revenue that comes from development goes to these cities and they have to waive uh, perhaps what they would realize in revenues to go to the transit agency. But this is something we should be looking at very, very closely, how we capture the value that we create by putting transit uh, or implementing transit in those, in those areas. Sherry, Sherry, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I preempt you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So despite the fact that the public-private partnership pilot program that David and I worked on together created these three slots where there were transit properties that did something that felt uncomfortable to them, which is apply to the New Starts program and include a financing element in it, despite that, we really only had two PPP projects that had an F component in it of a design, build, operate, finance, maintain with Phil in Denver and now with Pete in Maryland. So one of the things we heard from DJ before he had to depart is that the administration is looking at incentivizing behaviors that they want to see as part of the infrastructure initiative. So presumably that would mean what we've already seen in the TIGER program. You all know that this latest round of TIGER came out and had a provision in it that included, um, it, you know, you get an extra check in the box, a star by your name, if you're including private sector investment in it. So despite the fact that we only have these two examples and we've got a president who's incentivizing private sector, we only have two really good examples in the transit space within the past couple of decades. I wonder, Phil and Pete, if y'all have anything that you would want to say or kind of lessons learned that you might help the industry understand where they could put their, their money behind it. Because one of the things that I think David experiences, David's experience would echo also is that it's really the money chasing the deals, not the deals chasing the money. So how do we make it easier for transit properties to think outside the box and do more private sector investments based on the fact that we only have these two examples out there to look at? Um, I, I, as I'm sure you know, you, you are absolutely correct that, I mean, right now the country is awash in cash looking for deals to take part in. Um, and that the struggle, of course, is is to find owners who are willing to use that that method uh, of procurement, and they're far and few between. I know that we uh, in Maryland actually there there was two. We had uh, a red line in Baltimore, and that was also had nine hundred million dollars of, of new starts, uh, but the problem was it was in my opinion, not put together well as a project and would have exceeded its costs by billions. And so we, we canceled that. But ag again, it's who's comfortable taking this political risk undertaking P3s. And I still think, that's, I, I still think there's political risk there. Um, certainly Virginia has an example of that um, with uh, 460. Yes, that? that's right. Yeah, 460 was an example of you know, substantial political risk, even though the project itself was put together well. And, and when you consider the the term that, you know, even governors are in limited periods of time, the procurement process takes a very long time. So when do you, who gets the benefit of a P3? Probably not the person that initiates it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the, the next person after. So why take political risk when you, you know, when your term is not going to receive the benefit of it. Now, that's my assessment of what's going on around the country. Obviously, in Maryland, our undertaking of, of the P3 to provide uh, express tollings on 495 and on 270, um, and hopefully uh, Maryland 295. We're willing to take that risk. We know it's, it's, it's something that the region desperately needs. And so I think uh, it's, it appears that uh, it's going to be a very attractive deal, uh, given the amount of interest that we're seeing in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, a couple of things. I, I think, one, I would love to see the Penta P program resurrected, right? And I've mentioned this to DJ. I would love to see, I mean, I don't know, is, is it dead? I, I don't know. Is it really dead? I'm not sure. Um, but I would love to see it resurrected because that, uh, would incentivize uh, transport transit agencies around the country to, you know, dabble in it. The other thing is, in order to facilitate a good P3, the private activity bonds that was just talked about uh, by DJ, or, or there was a question out here, uh, that has to stay there. We need private activity bonds if you're going to do these P3s, I think. Um, and so the talk of eliminating those kind of troubles me. Uh, as we as we look to to do those things, I think the last thing um, th that I would mention on these P threes is we have to continue to evangelize uh, and advocate uh, for this delivery method around the country. Um, and and I think elected officials, to Pete's point, 
um, you have to really realize that infrastructure takes a long time. Um, you know, when, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, when he thought about the, the interstate highway system, uh, he knew it wouldn't be built in four years. <laughs> you know, it took like, you know, 40 years or so, maybe 50 years, but there was an understanding from our infrastructure forefathers that it would take longer than one term of office to build infrastructure. And I think we have to get back to that and challenge our elected officials that infra we're building infrastructure that will last for the next 100 years. It's going to take a little time to build it. Uh, and I, I think if we can start educating our elected officials on that to at least start these projects, um, I think that would be beneficial. Can we just take two more questions? Good, Dan. Yeah, one thing that I like you, it, what you said about expanding the perspective on P3s, I think to consider them merely as concessions is a mistake because between 2000 and 2007, I count at least 10 transit uh, uh, new starts or related fixed guideway projects in the United States that were P3s. They may have been joint development or transit area development or design build, but they Hudson Bergen. Uh, before uh, the project you mentioned in Denver, we had T-Rex, yeah. and that was a P3, and that mm -hmm. was before the Eagle project mm -hmm. that dealt with commuter rail. And, you know, uh, look at what's happening in Florida with the uh, very high-speed or high-speed rail project that Florida East Coast Railroad's doing. It's based primarily on uh, air rights uh, funding that's going to come from development. And I would add one other thing. When we talk about embracing the private sector, can we expand that to be private sector approaches? So they embr we embrace the approach or approaches. I think the public sector can go a long way by taking in to its own perspective how the private sector does it. Why can't the public sector do more things like the private sector? And I paint an example is the Florida Turnpike Enterprise, which is like, it's a toll road, but it's run like the private sector, but with public sector mission and public accountability. I, I just would like to comment because, you know, that's very frequently said is why can't government work like the private sector? And that's, I, I've heard that for decades. And I think there's, a, there's an absolute reason that, that they're not perceived to uh, operate the same. And that is because the private sector has a different currency than the public sector. And obviously, in the private sector, it's dollars. And in the public sector, it's public approval. And yet, you're going through the same process. When you undertake a project, uh, for instance, if I put it in a personal sense, I'm putting my public approval at risk. And if it fails, then the next secretary is going to have to resolve that. So there's the, the dollars become second to public approval. I mean, and that's just a statement. All over the country, that's how it, that, that's what happens. And the private sector, it's dollars that supersede public approval. So neither wants to waste the second, but if one has to take primacy, it's going to be on the public sector, public approval, even if it doesn't make the most sense dollar-wise. Uh, Art Gazzetti with APTA. I uh, applaud the administration for taking on infrastructure as one of its you know, top priorities uh, because Lord knows there is an infrastructure deficit around the country. Uh, David, some of the things we've talked about today, enhancing private sector involvement, check, let's do that. Uh, low cost capital for projects, check, that's a good idea. Uh, uh, real estate, we should, transit agencies should make money from their real estate. Uh, yes, uh, local governments have been stepping it up around the country uh, in a big way. Uh, so all of those things are great ideas. But given the magnitude of the infrastructure deficit, I, I, I would, uh, uh, you know, assert against my uh, good friend DJ that, you know, the federal rule shouldn't just be let's, you know, let's offload the burden to all these other things. I, I think the deficit is such that the federal rule needs to be strong in addition to all those other good ideas. So I, I make that sort of as a comment, but I, I, I would like to turn it into a question. Uh, what should be the federal rule? Gentlemen. Uh, well, let, let me, I'll, I'll start. Hopefully I won't get in trouble uh, with this thing. Hey, listen, I, I agree there should be real dollars coming out of the federal government. And uh, when, when you look at 
uh, these projects that are of regional and national significance. Uh, in LA, 40% of this nation's goods come through those LA ports. Now, uh, when the trucks come out of there and tear up the roads uh, and all of that, uh, then the federal government, I think, should have, you know, they should have a funding role in that. They absolutely should, when for, especially when 40% of the nation's goods are coming out of those ports. And so I am a, a proponent and an advocate um, of the federal government uh, really putting in real dollars. Um, uh, this idea, and we've we've uh, you know heard about the one trillion dollar uh, in infrastructure. Um, I want to see some real dollars. I mean, when you look at the state of California, uh, who probably uh, sends more uh, in taxes to Washington probably than any other state. I don't know. Uh, there, there may be others, uh, and the the return that comes back on infrastructure. Uh, when we start talking about that it's, it's much less than we anticipated, that is an issue. So I, I fully agree that it should be real dollars. I don't want to see any gimmetry, um, you know, coming out, you know, smoke and mirror financing. Uh, we need real dollars if we're going to keep up with the infrastructure demands. If, if I could. Go ahead. Um, I agree. I agree with the, the funding side of it. I, I also come at it from a little different uh, perspective, which is, you know, to me, the federal role um, should be where they add value. If they don't have value, then they shouldn't be there. Um, so I think there's a lot of areas where, in effect, they're there but don't add value. Um, so I think that's the other side of the coin. It's just not the funding part of it, but but processes and different things. Again, talking as picking up what I talked about before, allowing you know agencies to perform as best as a business when you've got a three billion plus dollar business. Let us behave like a business. Let us react like a business. And so if you add value to that, that's great. If you don't, then get out of the way. Well, I, I think the idea that says the federal government doesn't have a role or should have a diminishing role in transportation is preposterous. I mean, we have to have a national transportation system. And in fact, I recently have adopted a phrase about, you know, we have to have a system of systems. Right, as, as a nation. And we can't operate as, as a single nation and, and a single economy when we have disjointed transportation, we have islands of good in a sea of poor. It won't work, and that means American citizens are going to pay the price for that. So yes, there's a federal role. I think the federal government has been ignoring that role for quite some time now, and I believe that um, it's time that we, we, in fact, put the federal dollars where they belong, uh, but, but I do believe that absolutely there's got to be a strong federal presence uh, in, in a transportation system that benefits the entire country. Well said. Well, we should adjourn uh, before doing so. Uh, thank our panel. Great, great discussion. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.